Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Evacuation has been the buzzword since Taliban took over Afghanistan on August 15. And while some have managed to evacuate their citizens and save their lives, others find themselves in a perilous situation. And now with a twin blast by Islamic State of Khorasan, right at the center of the evacuation point of Kabul airport, even boarding an available outbound flight has become no lesser than dicing with death. Have a look. Terrorists broke into the empire of terrorists and unleashed mayhem, killed dozens of innocents and wounded even more. This is the most important takeaway of the week in Afghanistan, where the situation is deteriorating with every single minute. Islamic State, which has been at loggerheads with Taliban over the control of territory, has done to it what the militant group itself has been doing to Afghans for years. In the twin blasts that claimed over a hundred lives, including more than a dozen of US Marines, the Islamic State has just rung the alarm bells for the Taliban and the so-called the Great Game of Afghanistan is seemingly entering into an even more dangerous stage. Another major takeaway that is no short of mother of irony is that Taliban has condemned the attack as a terror attack. And now it is not just the Taliban that is set to see a treacherous road but those stranded in the country are fearing even more for their lives. German Minister of Defense said that evacuation has become even harder and has urged its citizens to not travel without security. Aber wir befinden uns jetzt in der sicherlich hektischsten, in der gefährlichsten, in der sensibelsten Phase. Wir wissen, dass die Terrordrohungen sich massiv verschärft haben, dass sie deutlich konkreter geworden sind. Das Außenministerium hat heute Nacht auch die entsprechenden Personen in Kabul entsprechend informiert, dass sie nicht mehr auf eigene Faust zum Flughafen kommen sollen. Earlier in the week, the Taliban ordered that no Afghan will fly out of the country while the foreign nationals were asked to leave by on or before the deadline of 31st August. They even announced the list of their cabinet that will run the country. Meanwhile, India, that has kept its cards close to chest, despite aware of the threat that Taliban, which has been working in cohesion with Pakistan's ISI, has doubled down its efforts on evacuating its citizens. This batch of people in an Indian paramilitary bus is the sixth fortunate group that was evacuated from Afghanistan before things turned from chaotic to absolute mayhem at Kabul airport. New Delhi says it has safely brought back most of its citizens. The recent flight also brought Nepalese nationals and some Afghans who had sought Indian assistance. While underlining a united position on Afghanistan across Indian political spectrum, Foreign Minister Subramanian Jay Shankar said that his team was committed to bring back the remaining Indians too. We have uh, under operation Devi Shakti done six flights. The more latest flights was this morning, which took off at three o'clock. Uh, we have brought back most of the Indians, but not all of them. There are still a few out there. Uh, some of them could not make it for the flight yesterday. Uh, but definitely we will try and bring out everybody. We have also brought out uh, some Afghan citizens uh, who wanted to come to India at this point of time. Indian government also ensured that its nationals were safe even during the Taliban raids and a growing threat of them being targeted by ISI-backed ragtags. We don't know the situation of the outside, so we were working in the U.S. Army base, in Kabul, in the airport. So, I don't have any idea, you know, Taliban. Yeah. Can you tell me what is Kabul airport? It's true, it's true. 
The situation in Afghanistan stands at a point where even the United States, supposedly the most powerful country under the sun, is appearing helpless. Apart from condemning attacks and expressing solidarity from a distance, Washington hasn't been able to control even one situation in Afghanistan in past two weeks. And this has left observers to only wonder if the states has really run out of ideas to deal with the Taliban and other terrorist groups that pose a great threat to it and its allies, or it is all a smokescreen to hide the script that was written by the US itself. The upside downturn of Afghan situation in just two weeks has also left observers wondering if the Taliban alone or any terrorist group for that matter is capable of executing such a plan where a country falls to radicals in just a matter of days. Previous Kabul administration always accused Islamabad of nurturing Taliban and providing them sanctuary. Other countries like China too have been trying to make inroads in this strategically located country. So what are they up to now? What has been their position and how are they raising their stakes amidst a deteriorating situation? Let's try to find out through this report. If there is one country that deserves discredit and denunciation for today's ghastly situation in Afghanistan, it is Pakistan. Trying to project itself a deft diplomatic state, this country is responsible for pushing Afghanistan on the verge of ruins. A sustained nefarious agenda for decades has finally paid off. It has broken into a country that it always sought to keep under its influence. However, the grim reality is that it managed to succeed despite the whole world knowing that Taliban was being sponsored by Islamabad for all these decades. And while it may not achieve what it always wanted, the U.S. is out. And there could not have been a better gift to its real masters in Beijing, who have been desperately yearning for a strategic, political and business space in Kabul. Experts also say that Islamabad and Beijing, who have been given a bloody nose by India in recent past, might want to use Taliban mercenaries to create more troubles in Kashmir. India says it has been closely monitoring all the developments but has also sought more intel sharing among Quad members to keep the enemy at bay. We are concerned about what is happening anywhere in the region because uh, it's not just a northern neighbor, even a western neighbor has uh, these nuclear weapon systems. So we are surrounded by two neighbors uh, which are armed with these strategic weapons. And therefore, we are evolving our uh, strategies accordingly. Then there is Beijing, which in the immediate aftermath of Kabul falling to the Taliban said that it was ready to develop good neighborliness and friendly cooperation with them. Experts say that Beijing has been engaging with Taliban for years. Even the Taliban has specifically said that it wants to develop good relations with China. While China could be eyeing the vast resources of landlocked nation, the Taliban would have a UNSC permanent member's backup to stake their claim of getting recognition. Unlike most of the ambassadors who have fled the Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, China continues to have its man on the ground, clearly indicative of the bonhomie the two have forged in past without any limelight. China. 尊重阿富汗人民自主决定自身的前途命运支持将阿仁主导阿仁所有的原则落到实处愿继续同阿富汗发展睦邻友好合作关系为阿富汗和平与重建发挥建设性的作用 the reverse side of analysis, however, is not pleasant for both Pakistan and China, who see Afghanistan as their asset. The relationship could become tricky, for Taliban doesn't recognize the Turan line, and that could drive a wedge between Islamabad and Kabul. China has been mercilessly eliminating Uyghur Muslims from Xinjiang, 
and Afghanistan could become home to them. And if East Turkestan Islamic movement gets space in Afghani mountains, their efforts will not just go in vain, but turn counterproductive. And now let's talk about the COVID-19 situation in the region, which has taken a backseat in newsrooms amid spiraling Afghan situation. While India has reached another milestone of inoculating 610 million doses with daily average reaching as high as 5 million, a ravaged Afghanistan, which already had a crippled health system, has witnessed an 80% weekly decline since it was seized by the Taliban. Meanwhile, in Sri Lanka, which is registering a record number of cases, cardboard coffins and innovative invention replacing wooden casket is hitting the headlines. Have a look. A box factory in Dehiwala bound Lavenia city near capital Colombo is assembling a special product, cardboard coffins. Made out of recycled paper, which costs as low as one-sixth of even the cheapest wooden casket in the country, the cardboard coffin will also bring down the need of wood, thereby helping in environment conservation. Priyantha Sahabandhu the local municipal councillor who came up with this idea says that cardboard option has emerged as a viable option for the poor amid a record surge in cases in the country. concept <laughs> So far, 350 cardboard coffins have been delivered since early 2020, and the factory is making another 150 ordered by the council. Meanwhile, India's drug regulator has granted emergency use approval for Zydus Kadila's COVID-19 vaccine, the world's first DNA shot against the coronavirus in adults and children aged 12 years and above. Experts say this is set to provide a further momentum to the world's largest vaccination program, which has already acquired a steady pace of immunizing nearly 5 million people every day. The country aims to completely immunize its entire adult population of around 944 million by December. The vaccine ZyCoVD uses a section of genetic material from the virus that gives instructions as either DNA or RNA to make the specific protein that the immune system recognizes and responds to. If you look at our event data, all our event data was post April and May. Uh, and we know that in India, 99% of all uh, COVID cases were driven by the Delta variant. Even if you look at our vaccine in terms of when we did the uh, DNA analysis or the analysis of the variants for the breakthrough events that happened, uh, all of them were the Delta variant. So I think for us, what we can safely say is that our efficacy against the Delta variant in, interim, in the interim analysis is about 66%. And while at front, Afghans are reeling under Taliban return, its vaccine program too has gone for a toss amid the chaos and killings. As per UNICEF, a United Nations agency, the vaccination rate, which was dismal even during a relatively stable Afghanistan, has suffered a major blow during Taliban takeover, with immunization going down by 80% in the week that followed the conquest. Even more concerning is the fact that the Johnson & Johnson vaccines that were delivered to Afghanistan under COVAX program will expire in a few weeks. And with Taliban's possible skepticism to vaccines, the looming troubles for Afghans are just going to multiply in coming days. 
now in our section of Asia this week, the stories from across the continent that hit the headlines this week. Japanese company Rinnai is famous for gas stoves and water heater. Recently, it has developed thermal energy tools and machinery. Over a century old company continues to produce advanced devices to improve social life. In 1918, the founder of Rinnai, Hidejiro Naito, invented an oil gas cooking stove. It aims to realize comfortable daily life based on the principle of contribution to society. The latest micro and ultrafine bubble technology of Rinnai provides a comfortable bath unit. The bubble has three categories, which are milli, micro and ultrafine. The process by which a fine bubble is created and this has been made possible by Rinai's accumulated technology. Micro and ultrafine bubbles technology is beneficial for health. It penetrates the pores of the skin and keeps the skin hydrated. The bubbles even help to remove dirt from skin. Rena is also conducting a clinical trial in nursing homes for the elderly to further improve the functioning of the product. Some parts of northern Japan witnessed severe winter weather and a heavy snowfall. Located in Nagano prefecture, Liyama city has cleverly transformed those pesky heavy snows into snow dome or kamakura restaurant. Visitors come here from across Japan to enjoy unique experiences and taste traditional dishes in the annual village of Snow Dome. The idea started 22 years ago when people used to shovel snow off road and pile it into empty field. To keep the kids entertained, they turn it into Snow Dome. Then the idea expanded to an annual festival to attract visitors. <laughs> で、the cost of renting single dome is about $30 for an hour and a half. It includes local delicious meal. Visitors can also stay until evening to enjoy dinner with another atmosphere in the place through the lighting of candles around the snow dome. The United States will donate 1 million Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine doses to Vietnam, Vice President Kamala Harris said while on her state visit to the country this week. Vietnam has fully inoculated just 2% of its 98 million people, among the lowest in Asia, as it opted for containment policy and did not rush to procure vaccines which it deemed financially too risky due to a severe global shortage. Ties between Hanoi and Washington have grown closer more than four decades after the Vietnam War ended in 1975. However, Washington has said there are limits to the relationship until Hanoi makes progress on human rights. Analysts say Vietnam wants to upgrade its diplomatic relations with the United States to a strategic partnership, but is concerned such a move would anger Beijing.
Malaysia's foreign and new Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaqub as the Southeast Asian nation battles its worst COVID-19 surge and public anger grows over mismanagement of the pandemic. The appointment of Ismail Sabri restores the role to a party tainted by graft accusations after he secured a parliamentary majority from the same alliance that collapsed this week and replaced Mohaddin Yassin. Smail Sabri, formerly Mohaddin's deputy, was sworn in at the National Palace after being picked by King Al Sultan Abdullah, the constitutional monarch. He took the oath of the office in front of the monarch and other coalition leaders, including former Prime Minister Najib Razak. He becomes Malaysia's third Prime Minister since the 2018 election after UMNO pulled its backing for Mohaddin last month, citing his failure to manage the pandemic. Moving on, in the Himalayan nation Nepal's capital Kathmandu, scores of Hindus gathered at the famous world heritage site Basant Darbar Square to celebrate the annual Gai Jatra festival. Gai Jatra, also called as Cow Festival, is celebrated every year to commemorate the death of loved ones. Scores of Hindus gather every year at the UNESCO World Heritage Site Basanpur Darbar Square in Nepal's capital Kathmandu to mark a peculiar Gai Jatra. Gai means cow while Jatra is for musical procession. The festival falls on the first day of the waning moon in the month of Bhadra, the fifth month of the lunar calendar. It is celebrated every year in memory of their deceased loved ones with the belief that their souls will attend salvation. Children dress up as deities and people of all ages in the guise of cows and lunatics go around the city to commemorate those who died in the family. Bereaved families offer fruits, bread, beaten rice, curd and money to those participating in the procession, including the cows. Although popular across the country, Gai Jatra is mostly observed by the Nevari and Thadu communities of Nepal. It is believed that the festival derives its name from the religious belief that the deceased during their journey to heaven cross a legendary river by grabbing the tail of a cow. Family members of the deceased of the past year sent people, mostly children, dressed as cows to parade on the streets. The persons who dress up as cows also have an artificial tail, which has the same purpose. <laughs> The people glorify the deeds of their disease through songs and hymns in order to inform and encourage others. Apart from this, the funeral rites are completed after people conclude their city-wide musical procession. The ancient tradition which still is practiced in the present time is believed to have started over a thousand years ago by the Nevari community of Nepal. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.